Okay. Hey, the seasons are changing here in Thunder Bay where we're switching gears from sailing on soft water to hard water. And I've got a special guest with me today to make sure all my gear is ready. So when I hit the ice for the first time, I'm not fumbling around. So I'm Mike Madge with SailJuice.com. And joining us today is a multiple world champion in the DN, Matt Struble from San Diego, California. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing, Mike? Yeah, great to uh, join uh, with you and everyone participating and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Any ponds freezing over in San Diego yet or? Only in the margarita glasses. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you know as well as I do that the, your opportunities to ice boat are, are, you know, limited. It's not like soft water where you're going to go there and there's always got to be water. And uh, if you're passionate about it, like I know you are and I am, you don't want to miss any opportunities. So you want to make sure your gear is all ready to go and, uh, uh, you know, even before the ice comes. So I, I want to just start off. You know, I, I'm just starting in. I've gone to a swap meet. I've picked myself up some new gear. I'm new to the sport. Um, and I want to make sure when I hit the ice this winter, it's all ready to go. So so maybe let's just start off, you know, my skates. Well, what am I looking at in terms of having my skates ready to go? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. And I mean, overall, I mean, there's a lot of different depths to that question. But yeah, I think starting out, you know, looking at your equipment, obviously, uh, our time, you know, on the ice, the conditions are, are quite limited. And so having everything ready to roll, you know, when it's when you're able to sail your your equipment needs to be ready. So, um, you know, I, I have always uh, set my boat up when I lived in the Midwest, I'd always rig it up, you know, in the fall of the year, just to look over everything, you know, make sure everything is healthy, you know, simple things from the main sheet uh, to, you know, the fittings to the, the rigging. And then of course, uh, runners, good thing about runners are, is you can look at those any time of the year, you know, in your garage, your basement, you know, the comfort of your home, you don't need to be outside. So, um, you know, you're checking for the, the obvious things, uh, nicks, you know, any rust perhaps that's on them, but then really down, into the the key points is you know really what what kind of profile they have on them alignment of course and then you know really a matter of safety is how sharp they are you know, you, you got, got to have control especially if you're new to the class uh, having sharp runners is really key and you, you really you really want you know someone to to bounce off you know your your equipment on and you know have a buddy or somebody and just talk through that but uh, sharp runners I think are really key for everyone's safety. And I guess, especially with the, the early ice being black ice, you, you can be assured that, you're, you know, it's going to be good hard ice. So, so a question for, for someone, say like myself, I don't have the luxury of a club here. I don't have an 80 inch, uh, you know, belt sander. Uh, can I do it on my own with honing it or? You can. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a pretty tough haul to reprofile you know runners without you know having a pretty nice uh you know sander belt sander or something of that nature um but if if the runners are in decent shape you know, you've got a good straight edge you know a ground steel straight edge and and you can look at the profile of the runners and depending on what the runners are you you have a good you know general setup you know 15 inches of crown you know with feeler gauges on the end these kinds of things um you know, if, if they're not sharp or they have nicks in them, you can tune them up uh, pretty easily with uh, little honing stones or sandpaper on a hard pad. There's, there's definitely a lot of things you can do without a lot of equipment. Yeah, now, now I've got one of my skates here. So I'm just thinking now in terms of feeling for nicks, are you just the basic, just running your nail over it and feeling if there's any irregularities to the skate? Is that what you're doing? That's right. Yeah. I mean, because ice boats, you know, they operate on, you know, such a, a low drag configuration that any little burr or nick or hang up on the steel to the ice surface is of course going to be induced drag. And that's what we don't want. So yeah, I take my fingernail right on the end and run down it from, you know, nose to tail. And I usually, you know, I, I'm pretty sensitive about it. So even if I, I, I do it a lot of times and if I, I think I feel something, I'll run back over it a few times and just confirm, you know, what sort of condition that running edge is in. And, and in terms of the sharpness, is, is your 
your nail over the edge, is that a good indication of sharpness? Is that what you're looking at? It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. You want it sharp enough to where it, you know, without much pressure, obviously on, on your fingernail, it, it actually shaves off a, a bit of your nail. And if it does that, it's a pretty good indication you're, you're in the sharp condition. Okay. So I guess the next thing is we get our skates on, on our boat, on the plank. Uh, I mean, it's pretty imperative, I guess, that those skates are parallel to each other. So, so maybe just from a, a beginner's point of view, uh, take us down from a beginner's point. What's the minimum requirement you're thinking about in terms of how exact you want those skates to be parallel to each other? Yeah, so what I, I do uh, you know, with the runner plank is on a workbench, I flip it upside down and deflect it down. I, with my configuration, you know, I, I think of it as you know, light air. Let's say you pushed off the starting line, jumped in the boat, and just ghosting along with no wind pressure, uh, my plank configuration is, is flat or zero. If you ran a string from the chalk mounting surface to the plank across to the other end, the center of the plank would just touch it. So I upside down on a workbench, I deflect the plank into that same configuration. And then I've got a dial indicator uh, with a rod that I can run from one cutting edge of the runner to the other. And I, I typically, I don't get so sensitive out to the very ends of the runner because my general profile is, is pretty rounded uh, lead in and lead out or exit. So I, I generally just measure, you know, where those feeler gauges, where we check for crown is to the straight edge. So you know, on average, uh, you know, 15 or 18 inch uh, runner profile, that's where I'm checking alignment. And I'm looking for um, alignment within 10 thousandths of an inch over that profile. So it, uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, they get within a thousandths of an inch or whatever, but it, uh, you know, with temperature changes and, you know, slight configuration changes, um, my rule of thumb is if I'm within 10 thou plus or minus, uh, I'm pretty happy and I consider that a, a usable configuration. Okay, now, now getting to the plank, like, I, I mean, I know myself when I bought uh, my DN, I mean, I was pretty naive. I, I come from the laser background, Hobie 16, uh, sh strict one design classes. So oh, I, I bought a, a DN thinking, oh, okay, a DN is a DN. Uh, but I guess when you buy it, uh, you, you really got to check to make sure that, that it fits right in terms of the plank. So so when you're measuring up a plank, what, what, how are you doing it, and 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 what what are you looking for? Yeah, I uh, well one one thing just to jump back to you know speaking of the plank and the runners, you know matching or fitting properly. I think one thing that's real critical, particularly if you're, you know, if you're just getting into the sport and you bought a used you know boat, is the fit between that runner body, if you will, into the chalk section that's real important because oftentimes you'll see you know a mismatch between that fit and it's just one of those simple areas you you want to have that fit uh quite nice and there's different ways to shim those you know people have used teflon tape and and other sorts or or thin fiberglass sheet or phenolic sheet or something of that nature but the fit and that's that's one of those good pre-season you know checks uh, especially if you have a, a new plank, a new set of runners, a new configuration that's new to you, is making sure that fit between the different components of the hardware fit properly. And, and the nice thing about the DN is everything is a uh, component, so you can you know adjust, customize uh, different parts to get it all to fit together. But that that's real critical. Um, and then getting out of the the plank deflection, um, you know it it almost you know, to me in the technical form, it, 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 it lends itself to a little bit deeper discussion into the whole package, be, right? Because the whole boat needs to work in harmony for the best performance. And what I mean by that is it's, it's easy to get out of balance from the standpoint if, if you have a soft mass and a stiff plank, they're, they're really not working well together. What, you know, the energy from 
the wind and the hiking and leverage all the things then is, is primarily going into just the mast configuration if, if you're soft mast, stiff plank. So it's, it's really important to have a balance between the two components, the primary you know, components that are deflecting the mast and the plank. And those really need to be a, a, a set configuration working together. So, so you're saying you can't have a mismatch. It, it, you know, the soft plank is not going to make up for a stiff mast, or that's right. Yeah, it it, it won't work very well, um, both from a, a boat performance as well as a control on the ice uh, scenario, which you know obviously is important to to get yourself around the racetrack safely. And that, now I know there's a lot of really good uh, ice with yourself, but just for somebody that's just bought his boat. Uh, you know, and he wants to check and see if his plank, he thinks it's, it's the right deflection for him. Well, what's a quick and easy way for him to do that? Yeah, general rule of thumb is uh, I think for the most part, folks are operating between like an um, inch and a half deflection to two inches of deflection, you know, as just a, a general rule of thumb. But it, um, like I say, it, it really, that, that'll just get you on the ice, but then you got to dial in you know, just a, a specific configuration with the rest of your boat. And that's just with standing on the plank and measuring how much you deflected it? Right. Yep. Yep. That's just a, a quick, you know, reference to see where you're at. Okay. Now, in terms of hull alignment, uh, how, how much importance do you put on that? Uh, you mean the, the hull to hull the to plank? plank? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, that's, that's real important because uh, obviously we sail on both uh, port and starboard tack and because, you know, the boats are going fast and the steering input is so sensitive to angle that any asymmetry between, um, you know, the plank and the hull uh, configuration will make it a very uncomfortable boat to sail on one tack or the other. So, um, you know, a, a pretty simple geometry check uh, with the plank you know, the hull mounted on the plank and then a, a tape measure to the bow to the one end of the plank, you know, that that's a, a satisfactory check to get you in the game. Okay. And, I, and I'm just going to, I know uh, Dave, Dave Frost is on here. He had a, a question about that hull alignment. Dave, you wanted to come on and ask a question about hull alignment to Matt there? Yeah, man. Uh, Oh, hold on a second. Um, I've got two devices going because my question was uh, the suspension up front of the boat. My apologies. Let me kill this. My question was the uh, suspension on the, the front of the, the bow. I know you run a fairly stiff uh, front end. What's the benefit and uh, con pros and cons of that? Yeah, I, I did that originally. Um, you know, I was looking at the, you know, one of my early, early uh, preseason uh, pre checks, I was looking at the configuration of the boat. You know, when it was fully loaded, the stern was quite low, of course, with plank deflection and the, the bow with the original uh, spring Sarns configuration, it was bow really high. So I was looking to do everything I could to lower the front of the boat to get the whole boat in a little bit better aerodynamic alignment. So part of that solution was, you know, taking the spring out on the bottom, doing a high density uh, rubber suspension, if you will. So there's still a little bit of give there, but it, it loads or lowers the bow of the boat in a static condition, even preloading. And so the boat's just real consistently aligned a little bit better with the, you know, for aero package. That, that's the, the basis of why I did what I did. How's that, Dave, did, did you have a follow-up question, Dave? You wanted to ask something? Oh, my follow-up question was uh, for a, a gimpy old man who's uh, trying to get off the line. I noticed the fast kids around me always pop off real quick, and I, I can get the speed, but it often takes me a little, little while. Uh, what's that trick to uh, a quick uh, quick start? 
Yeah, I think actually it's that's a, a great topic, and I it's it's one of the things I like to practice a fair bit of, um, especially early in the season and refine it throughout. But uh, you know, it's really part of the fitness program, I think, and then also looking at the you know your technical uh, phases of the starting line. But short or long is I think. Um, as Mike and I spoke last year about starting technique is really off the starting line, having your boat set up at a proper angle to where, you know, you can, you get initially that free BMG, right? Straight up wind and using both legs or that first phase of the start, being able to get those first, the first initial push and the, the next three steps, if you get that set up properly then when you begin to bear away you've got some room below you and so even if you're not the fastest guy you've developed some room to where you can allow the boat to sail into acceleration mode uh, even if you're not the fastest guy off the starting line and, and one of the things we talked about or you talked about last year matt was uh was in terms of powering up the boat, sometimes that sheeting in too early kind of has a negative effect there. Yeah, I think, you know, having that's, it's so critical setting the, the directional alignment of the boat on the starting line. And, and you'll notice, you know, to that, um, you know, most of the top guys, they, they set the boat up. There's a little bit of wind shift. If, if I'm getting, I'm on a little bit of a lifted, you know, I'll just push on the side of the hull and the, the runners will just skid sideways a little bit and get it angled more into the wind, you know, cause the last thing you want to do is take a step off the starting line, have the boat hike, you know, now you're, you're chasing, right. You're trying to catch up. So the initial first push off the starting line should be, you know, only about, you know, 25% powered by the wind at that point. And now you can bear away because the good thing with the ice boat is bearing away is easy off the starting line, heading up is impossible, right? While you're standing and running. So having that initial setup and being willing to adapt as the wind shifts occur, you know, right before the flag drops. So, so just while we're on that topic, uh, um, Matt, uh, another question came in from Dave Glick. Uh, I don't know if Dave's out there, if you want to come on or I can ask for you. I'm not sure if Dave. Uh, so the basis of Dave's question was he uh, talking about powering up uh, the sail, powering up and powering it down. He he's uh, he wanted to know that when it gets windier, uh, he's lowering the sail and and loosening off his forestay and, and without changing his side stays. And he's wondering if that's a a good route to go to to pow power down a bit in the higher winds. Yeah, I'm operating uh, identical um, from the stand. Actually, my side stays are not adjustable. They're fixed length. And so I've gotten into a configuration where 90% of the time, I would say, I'm only adjusting the sail height on the mast. And that's really adapting to changing wind strength or different sails that I'm using, uh, depending on ice conditions and wind strength. Um, even at this point, four stay adjustments are pretty minimal uh, that I'm contending with. But yeah, I, I, I've got the same approach. And um, that's, you know, really once you have a refined program, you know, mass, plank, everything's in harmony. Um, I'm not moving the plank fore and aft uh, unless it's real extreme con conditions, of course, which we definitely see in ice boats, you know, if it's real soft ice in the spring or something of that nature. Um, or, or really cold and snow on the ice. But in average conditions, uh, my plank is, is one click back from all the way forward on the, the standard hull plank fittings and um, side stays are fixed and I'm adjusting the, the sail height depending on conditions. And, and exactly what Dave's saying is in a little bit of breeze, more breeze, you can lower the sail down, close that gap down between the boom uh, blocks in the deck of the hull because you have more natural power from the wind pressure to bend the rig out. So you, you don't need that added compression of the main sheet to initially bend the rig. In lighter air, you know, obviously with uh, a little bit more room under the boom, 
uh, with the sail a little bit higher, you can induce a little bit of mass bend at times and you can, you can use that around the racetrack in different conditions. So is the, the thinking of lowering that sail, is that something like the same idea like uh, the deck sweeper? They've gone to the deck sweepers with uh, the A-cats and, and boats like that. Is that kind of the same thinking? Uh, a little bit, but I, there's another factor in here because we're using these, these bendy rigs on ice boats is you know lowering the sail a little bit gets a little bit more sail area below the hound. And I, I think in one of our talks uh, previously, we talked about kind of that power triangle, right? Between the, the hound, the tack and the clue. And so when there's a little bit more breeze, I can lower the sail down into that power triangle, lower the center of pressure a little bit. And of course, less sheeting required to bend the mast. And it uh, is just a little bit different configuration. When you, you look at a DN sailing upwind or downwind with the rig bent out, you know, from the hounds up is not doing a lot of work for you. Obviously a little bit of twist profile as well as the mass deflection. Uh, it almost uh, creates an S bend, you know, from a, a four and a half look at the rig. So uh, the real usable part of the, the sail plan is from the hound down. Uh, now, just getting back to our, our you know, beginning of season and, and wanting to maximize our time on the ice, uh, you know, you, you have good ice, you, you, there's possibilities of breakdowns. What, what are things that you should be bringing on the ice with you uh, to make sure that you're not going to waste a good day? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, uh, I go to a little bit of an extreme at times from the standpoint that I generally carry two two complete programs around with me. So the ice is, uh, you know, it's so rare to, to have great conditions and go, I, I want no excuse why I can't get some training on the ice. So, but actually carrying with me out on the race course, you know, I, I carry a pretty small kit actually, you know, a runner bolt, uh, extra couple tools, uh, you know, some pins and ring dings. But beyond that, it's, you know, you're really looking at whether you, you know, you know, sail into a crack with, uh, you know, a lured runner or mast or something of that nature. But uh, on the ice, um, you know, spare parts is, is pretty minimal. Now, uh, now, again, you know, you want to get as much ice time as you can. And I think I remember reading an article about you when you were younger, you know, you would, it, it didn't really matter. You sailed on rough ice, snow ice. Uh, and, you know, how important is that just to get time on that boat? Like you don't always, you don't yeah. always have to look for perfect ice, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was blessed to, you know, grow up in Bay city, Michigan and, you know, uh, sailing with my dad and Jeremy Gujan, you know, we, I remember, uh, you know, when we first got into it, we sailed every weekend and now, you know, looking back on it, we sailed in just horrendous conditions at time. Um, but we learned so much and we got, you know, time in the boat and, you know, just running through all the different scenarios. And, you know, obviously it's, uh, it's good awareness, you know, just mentally seeing how the boat reacts in different conditions and, you know, both ice and wind and the whole deal. So, you know, it's part of my prep to big regattas is, is really that last four weeks before a world or North Americans, I'm solely focused on time in the, in the cockpit. I'll, I'll almost drive to wherever I need to go to, to get time on the ice and, and sail because it's that final refinement mentally and physically that you really need to be able to adapt to whatever the conditions are going to be. So a little bit tougher for me these days, uh, being in San Diego, but it, uh, I think it's, it is a real uh, critical part of the, the season prep, if you will, especially for big events. And I think uh, you would probably agree with this. Like, you don't always need a big surface of ice to, to get maximize your practice, right? Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, time time on the ice is time on the ice. The the one thing you do have to be real conscious of, I think, is um, oftentimes you know we'll sail on a, a small race course or something, and today I'm I'm just. It, right conscious to not tune my boat for those small race course conditions it uh at that point i'm just looking to get seat time 
And, you know, if I'm really prepping for a big regatta or something, I, I'll, I'll try not, not tune myself out of being competitive on a big race course. Cause we know at a, a world or North Americans, you know, you're on a, a mile plus course, generally uh, good conditions and three laps. So you really got to make sure you have boat speed on a big course, but uh, any seat time is good. It's just being conscious of what you're intending to get out of that training session. Okay, so, so it's all great to have all your gear ready, but I mean, a, a big component of that is having your body ready also. So uh, what, what goes into your, your physical re regime there? What, what, do you, what body parts are you working on? What type of exercises are you doing uh, to, to get you in, in sailing shape? Yeah, I like a lot of cross, you know, cross training type of activity. I, um, in recent years, I've, I've really gotten into, um, you know, a little bit more endurance stuff like cycling, which I, I think has brought my capabilities to a, a new level just from the standpoint of being able to deal with the demands of, a, you know, a longer regatta or, or bigger event, uh, not getting tired um, is, is really a big deal. Um, you know, I, I think because the starting, you know, in ice boat racing is so critical, I, I do some, you know, leg workouts that are specific for getting off starting lines, some squats, you know, and it, it can be simple activities. Um, you know, I've got an exercise ball and I'll, I'll lean it up against the wall, put my back to the ball and I can do, uh, squats, you know, in my living room and it's, it's quite effective. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, super sophisticated. Uh, but it does need to be focused and intentional over some time. You know, it's, it's one of those scenarios where you, you can't physically prep in the last week before the, the world championships or something. It's, it's something that you have to have a plan to execute. And, and I, that's why I, all my sailing, I, I try to break it down into seasons or phases and, you know, sort of a preseason, the core season, and then the postseason. And I'm looking to, to extract, you know, specific things out of those different phases. Uh, for example, you know, preseason is, is really physical fitness, um, you know, building or testing or tuning any new equipment that I want to try. Uh, that primary season phase is, is really time in the boat with my race intended equipment so that I'm, I'm getting my head wrapped around any you know, finesse required, any special tuning, any adjustments that I want to make. And then that postseason, I really take advantage of, of everything I've learned through those first two phases. And then I go at it again with another, um, you know, experimental phase, if you will, and whether it's sales, mass runners, um, you know, anything of the, of the like, I try to throw that in the mix. So it's, it's just being intentional uh, with what I'm trying to prepare for and, then you know not not getting outside those boundaries in that given phase of time now in terms of also exercise what, what do you do to your neck i mean that's obviously some uh, you know for ice boating anyways in particular is there any specific exercises you do or yeah that's that's a great question because that's probably the single toughest thing physically ice boat racing is it's uh, muscles that you just normally don't engage on a day-to-day -day basis so you know, I, I do, um, you know, leading up to, uh, to leaving San Diego, if I'm, I'm heading to the Midwest to do some sailboat racing on the ice, I'll, uh, you know, lay on my back, watch a little TV and I'll do some, you know, neck ups. And I, the, the one thing I would caution people to do is, is don't get out of control in that because I uh, don't think you need to do 200, you know, counts of lifting your head uh, up to watch TV. It's, uh, 20 times is good. And you do that a little bit over time and it, it really makes a significant difference. And of course, there's nothing better than getting on the ice and sailing around. But usually when I'm, when I'm back uh, over Christmas or something, getting some time on the ice, you know, it's about two or three days and all of a sudden you can sail around the race course, you know, three laps. So you don't use the uh, bungee setup. I don't use the bungee. I've actually, I've never tried it. Um, I've just stuck it out for, uh, you know, a little bit of prep and then a, a couple of days of sailing and generally pretty good to go for the season at that point. Now, any specific exercises for your arms with work in the sheet or. 
Yeah, I mean, I do a fair bit of sailing um, anyway, so um, that works out pretty well. I one of the things I love about ice boating is you're you're laying down, you're you know physically positioned perfectly to pull on the main sheet, right? Laying down, you can use your legs at times if you need to. Uh, obviously, your arms. I think hand grip is a big deal because obviously we don't have cleats on the main sheet. Um, so anything that engages those types of muscles, whether it's, uh, arm curls or, you know, pull-ups, any, anything of that nature, uh, engages that hand grip strength. And I, th I think that's really helpful for ice boat racing as well. Now, the other area of the body that tends to get stressed or for me anyways, on the ice is my calves. When I start sprinting with the cleats on, is there, is there anything you do pre-season to get those in shape or? Yeah, I don't know if you ever seen these, but there's uh, calf stretch boards and a lot of runners use them and things. And uh, I, I built one of those for myself and I, I use that. The other thing I do on the ice is because, um, you know, track shoes, spikes are, are made for sprinting in general. Um, I use a, a pole vaulting or a long jump type of spike and they have a little bit more heel on them. So you don't have so much angle, so much stress on your Achilles tendon and your calves. And then in between races, particularly at a big regatta, I'll take my spikes off and just uh, put my boots on. And that's, that's a huge rest for your, your calves and Achilles tendon. Now uh, with this gig I have with sail juice, I get to talk to quite a few elite sailors. And, and one of the, the common themes is, is, uh, especially when you're talking to sailors that have had injuries prior to an Olympic event or, or, or they're off doing an America's Cup and they're not getting to sail the boat that, that they want to campaign on, is uh, visualization seems to come up big. And I'm wondering with you, you know, living in San Diego and the limited amount of time you're getting to sail on the ice boat, uh, do you incorporate that into your program at all? Uh, it's a really interesting question. I've actually, nobody has ever asked me that before, but it's, uh, it's a great question. And um, I do a lot of visualization uh, in my mind. And I, it, it honestly started when um, I was in track and field, I was a pole vaulter. And because that was so technical and so hard, you couldn't slow it down, right? To, so you, you had to really visualize uh, the mechanics and the fluidity to get through that uh, type of event. And I've, um, you know, we all love sailing. I, I love sailing. I, the competition side of it for me is, is really just a validation of the work you put in. It's, it's not the driver for me. Um, so I've always, um, you know, loved to, to dream and, and think about sailing and, you know, all, all sorts of different things. And, it's, uh, it's such a fun sport. It's such a fun activity that um, I do think a lot about uh, ice boating in particular, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the perfect leeward mark rounding, getting off the starting line, you know, that feeling of going around the windward mark and you bear away and just thinking through all the different ways, the best VMG, you know, getting through traffic, those kinds of things. So I personally, I find it extremely helpful um, honestly, quite enjoyable. And it, it, it's part of what keeps me coming back is just being able to, to live through it without even doing it every day. So there's an old saying that it takes a thousand hours to make an overnight success. Uh, I mean, really, if you want to get good at ice boating, I mean, you complement your ice boating, you do a lot of soft water sailing. How, how, how much is, how helpful is that? And, and what type of boats would you suggest would be the most useful if you wanted to keep in in key shape for ice boarding. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting. It uh, you know finally materials and technology have allowed software softwater boats to at least get in the game of ice boats. You know historically ice boats there was just nothing like it, right? You know we sailed all sorts of things. Well today I I sail um, you know a cats a bit. I've I've I built several A cats and uh, foiling A cats, and have raced those uh, pretty successfully. And then uh, over the recent years, I've really gotten into foiling moth, international moth racing, and uh, it's the closest thing to sailing a DN around a race course uh, that I've I've been able to achieve uh, when it's warm out. And and I think that's that's really helpful. I mean, it's uh, it's really helpful from a, a tactical perspective. 
you know, having your mind in the, the race and it's, you know, when, you know, crossings and DNs, you know, are easily uh, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. And uh, in the summer water sailing we're doing today, uh, you know, international moss sails upwind, at, you know, a little better than 20 knots and downwind a little better than 25 knots on average. So they're, they're pretty quick today, um, extremely physical, uh, very technical, a lot of fun. So um, international moth, I think, is, is probably leading the world in soft water, high performance sailing of any kind of fleet size. And then uh, international A class, of course, is, uh, is right there. Well, Matt, I, I really enjoyed talking with you again. I know we have Deb uh, Whitehorse with us, the secretary of the class, and I want to get her on here for a couple of minutes just to talk about the, the upcoming schedule and anybody new out there that if they want to get part of the class and how to get involved. So we're going to give you a rest here, Matt, and uh, I'm going to give uh, Deb her a chance to come on here with us. I, I think she's she's still with us. Yeah. You're muted, Deb. There we go. All right. Hello, I'm Deb Whitehorse, uh, Executive Secretary Treasurer for the DN class. And uh, we do have regattas on the schedule. Um, our first, uh, the informal regatta, not sponsored by any class, but this is the Western Challenge. It's a great uh, DN class favorite. Uh, let Sometimes they're scoring, sometimes they're not. Uh, that takes place December 3rd through 5th. That's our first kind of unofficial regatta. Where? Best Ice in Minnesota. Probably near the Ashby, Minnesota era, area, Western Minnesota. Um, location is generally announced a couple days before the regatta. Uh, then we have a, a regional regatta that will take place in probably Wisconsin or Minnesota or the UP of Michigan, Western Region Championship, January 1 through 2. And I, can, we need, can people please mute their phones? That's exactly what it means. Good, Francis. Let me get. Okay, hello? Uh, so moving on, the uh, Western Region Championship, January, January 1 through 2. And Matt, I understand that you will be in Michigan and hopefully be able to attend that. I hope so. Yeah, it's one of my favorite events now because it's usually when I'm in town for the holidays and it, uh, the ice in uh, early season in uh, Wisconsin is usually fantastic. Yeah, well, we look forward to seeing you. Um, and then <clears throat> the DN class, uh, we have a North American championship scheduled uh, in January, the 23rd through the 29th. Now that may take, that also could be another US nationals non-ranking event. Um, we're going to do something and we're deciding next week. So, but definitely we're having a regatta that week. Um, and in a non-COVID year, we probably get about, you know, almost 100 participants for that. Um, that will, the Michigan uh, region is sponsoring the regatta, so they will be looking for ice in Michigan. Uh, if there are, isn't ice in Michigan, then we'll start looking where we need to. Um, and then the Gold Cup World Championship is in February, towards the end of February, uh, in Europe, uh, we alternate years on the world championship. So as far as I know, they're still planning on having it. Um, and all the information is available on the websites, uh, idniyra.org or uh, iceboat.org or dniceboat.org. Um, so that's, that's what I know about uh, DN regattas. Plus, there'll be other regional regattas, perhaps the New England area and also the central region. And possibly even a Canadian championship also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Um, so just, just a couple of questions, Deb. So 
people that want to join the class, they go to that website, they, they get in touch with you and they, and they join the class and, and joining the class you put out, a, it's a quarterly uh, uh, a magazine, is yes. that right? Yep, that's called Runner Tracks. Um, and then we also, uh, it's available online in a magazine format. And it has uh, technical articles, art, you know, regatta recaps, a lot of great photography. We're really lucky that uh, photographers have been very generous with us. Um, Gretchen Dorian, Kathy Fernbach, Sean Heavey, um, and I'm, I'm probably skipping people who all, Peter Johansson always share their photos with us. And I think the photos really help tell the story in the videos. Uh, then we also publish a yearbook, an annual yearbook that uh, has our regatta championship history. Um, we've been, the North Americans, I believe, started ooh, sometime in the 50s. And the, um, the world championship began in Gull Lake, Michigan in 1973, I believe. Um, then we have the specifications of the boat are online and in the yearbook. Um, and then people, we do keep our dues reasonable for 27 bucks, which is what, you know, going out to lunch these days, um, you can join for a year. And if you want any of the publications, they're available for purchase at a nominal cost. Yeah, and, and they're fantastic, the publications. I've had a couple of them and they're very professional, well done. Uh, and just to clarify, so the, the first event, the Great Western Challenge, you don't even have to really be a member. It's just basically nope. show up. Yep. And, and and it doesn't matter like DN, if you got an older DN, newer DN, it doesn't, everybody welcome. Yep. Run what you brung. Mm. Yeah, everybody welcome. It's a great event to kind of introduce yourself to the sport, uh, meet people. Um, everyone's trying out, you know, doing a lot of testing. It's very informal, very relaxed, very fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that was the first event I went to and it was very enjoyable. Well, I, I appreciate everybody coming on tonight. I don't see any other questions. I don't know if anybody wants to come on and have a, another question with Matt. Well, well, I had one more. I had one question to ask. Somebody emailed and wanted to know, Matt, what brings you to San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, work naturally, um, you know, sort of chase the employment around, I guess, as you will It, uh, you know, San Diego, it's a, it's a love hate uh, thing for me because I, you know, I, I deeply love ice boating. Um, and then, but yet there's such uh, amazing sailing in San Diego and what a place to, to live. So it, uh, it's tough to live both worlds, honestly, but it, uh, ice boat racing, if, if no one's, tried it i highly encourage them to try and i you know you know speaking about all the regattas coming up and things i i would highly encourage people to get out scrub race there's nothing more fun than just roaring around the race course learning asking questions the the fleet the all the people involved are fantastic super helpful um and and you'll learn a ton you, you don't need uh you know you don't need to enter a regatta to, to enjoy it or get exposure to it. There's a lot of weekend sailing all around the Midwest and it, everyone should try it at least once. Yeah. Find a local club is, you know, I, I didn't mention that the importance of local clubs, like I'm in the four lakes ice shot club and we, when we have conditions, we race and the, you know, DN class is definitely one of our, you know, racing classes. Um, man, one thing I'd like to ask getting a lot of inquiries from, moth sailors in yeah. Europe uh, that are kind of figuring out that DN sailing is is good training for them. Have you heard this as well? I'm, I got uh, two Australians contacting me this week. Yeah, I mean, every chance I get, I, I talk about, you know, the ultimate sailing is DN ice boat racing and that, you know, moth sailing is the next best thing. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, you know, I think the, the word, the focus on this kind of high performance sailing, it's, it's kind of ironic, right? Because ice boat racing is, is been around for a very long time. And, and this type of high performance uh, softwater sailing is, is really just coming to the forefront now. Um, 
So I, I think it's, it's just a natural attraction at this point for anyone into high performance sailing to be looking at, at ice boat racing. So yeah, I, I suspect that uh, flow of inquiries will not slow down as time goes on. Uh, on that note there, Matt, uh, uh, one of my last interviews with was Glenn Ashby and uh, that's on his bucket list. He says he's coming over to, uh, to do some ice boating. So we look yeah, forward to that. Yeah, that'd be good. He yeah. should. He, he should. should. So I do have a couple last questions here, Matt, that have come in. Uh, I don't know if I got the names right, but one person uh, is asking, is a carbon mass uh, uh, essential or just uh, recommended? Yeah, no, not, not essential at all. I mean, what really matters is that, I mean, today, honestly, right, it's uh, the only functional mass is a composite mass. And it's, it's because we used to all build our own mast out of wood and things, and, and we broke them all. Um, you know, Ron Cherry and team and, you know, Jeff Kent and all these guys come, came up with, uh, you know, some wonderful composite mast. And today there's lots of good options. And, you know, certainly the top, the pointy end of the fleet always gravitates towards, you know, whatever's the lightest, um, you know, newest thing and, and refine it and evolve it. But um, still uh, fiberglass mass, uh, especially for someone uh, getting going. Um, I know some of the guys in the top of the gold fleet are still using fiberglass mass. So it, uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, it's really that it um, is tailored towards your program, you know, that combination between the mast and plank uh, harmony and, and how it sets up with your sails and thing, but no, not, nothing wrong with a fiberglass mast at all. Okay. And, and another question here coming in is, uh, uh, this, uh, this gentleman from Sawdust Bay in New York has hull numbers one, eight, one, eight, and, uh, and, and one, nine, zero, zero. And, and the question he asks, he's asking, uh, is it worth rebuilding those and getting them back on the ice? I guess pretty open question, but. Yeah, I think any, anything that gets you on the ice sailing around is, is a, a positive thing to do. Um, I mean, the really cool thing about the DN, I think, is that it's made up of individual components that all come together that build this sailing machine. And the really neat thing about it is, is you can start out um, with a relatively old boat and upgrade components, build new components and add to your kit, your, your package over time. So it's, um, I, I think that's what's been so great about the class. You, you don't need to, to come in and, and necessarily spend a bunch of money or, you know, build the entire kit. You can, you can really start out with parts and components. I mean, I, think back to, to when my dad and I got sailing, that's, that's exactly what we did. You know, we, we built some stuff and had some parts and had, you know, we were lucky enough to be around some, some people that had um, some good equipment uh, that we were able to use at times and, you know, just, just build your experience, build your, your kit and move forward. So most important thing is, is getting out on the ice, uh, having a package that you can go sailing with and, and learn some things and then build on top of. And, and one other question coming in from uh, Josh. Uh, I don't know if you're on there, Josh. It might be better if you come on and ask some. It's a little open-ended. So are you, are you with us here, Josh, that you wanted to come on and ask your question? I am, yep. Yeah. Um, sorry for the background noise. I got my 3D printer running. Um, <clears throat> so you talked about your profiles on your runners. Um, Obviously, there's different snow conditions, ice conditions. I mean, what what do you recommend for someone starting out, um, and and specifically like angles, um, and, and profile shapes of those those runners? Yep. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I would I would before today I was thinking about um, you know if someone were getting into the class. I mean, with what I know today, if I were getting into the class, my my go-to would be, and it's honestly what I use 99% of the time when I sail today is uh, 3 16 36 inch long inserts, 90 degree uh, angle and 18 inches of profile. That's, I think with those, it covers such a vast um, array of conditions. 
and and quite competitive at the same time. So um, what I like about them, three sixteenths, they're a little bit thinner. They're a lot easier to sharpen. They're a lot easier to take care of. Um, you know, it, it used to be the, the standard go-to was, you know, a, a standard 30 inch Sarns, you know, bull nose, but honestly, I, I, I don't have much interest in quarter inch runners at all anymore. <laughs> They're just too hard to, to maintain and take care of. So three sixteenths runner is wonderful. And, uh, you'd be able to use that throughout the entire season. So when you say 18 inch profile, are you talking that's that 18 inches contacting the ice all the time? No, that's with, uh, there's, there's some good, some folks, I think the, the class has some good drawing schematics of that, but on a, a straight edge and then with some shims, you know, in measured to where they contact the straight edge plus the curvature of the runner blade would measure out at 18 inches. Okay. So well, it's, it's, yeah, it's a funny thing. It's something we had to do a, a long time ago and somebody had a good idea. I think the uh, business cards was, was the first go around to that to slide in the ends because it's so little profile or rocker that it's, it's hard to describe what that is. So with some, you know, measurement gauge uh, slid in from each end, it's, it's something that we can all talk around in a, a common format. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so you, you good with that then, Josh? Yep. Okay, thanks for coming on. Um, anybody else that wanted to shoot a question? If not, we'll, we'll see Matt on the ice in uh, hopefully a few weeks. I'm going fast. Sounds great, Mike. Thanks so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. And uh, if anybody missed this, it'll be uh, it'll be posted up on salejuice.com and and uh, hopefully we can have some more chats. Thanks again, Matt. Take care. You still there, Matt?